Uh, my name is Alfonso Aguaron, and I'll be moderating today's webinar on EHA 2000 highlights in multiple myeloma. So, uh, as part of Myeloma Patients Europe Educational Program, this session has the aim of informing patients, caregivers, and advocates about the latest updates on the therapeutic approach to multiple myeloma uh, that were presented at the EHA annual meeting held in Estocolm in June 2018. So uh, today it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Laurent Garderet from the Department of Hematology at the Saint Antoine Hospital in Paris. Uh, so Dr. Garderet, on behalf of MP, I would like to thank you for your time and effort for leading this webinar in such an important topic for the myeloma community and patients in particular. So um, this session will be fully recorded and later uploaded to the MP website which is www.mpeurope.org and also uh, to our YouTube channel. Um, so before we get started, I would like to, to comment on the webinar dynamics. So during the first part, uh, Dr. Katarek will proce proceed with his presentation and you will be able to follow the slides on your, on your screen. Then uh, once this part is finished, you will be able to ask your questions. Uh, to the doctor and there are two ways in which you can do that first you can press uh, the raise hand icon that you can see on the left side of the program to download it to join the webinar so i will unmute your microphone and you will be able to make your questions live uh, otherwise if you feel shy or you don't have a microphone you can always type your questions in the in the chat and the q a window and i'll read it to dr Catherine. So, uh, without any further ado, I hand over to Dr. Gadret and wish you all uh, a very fruitful uh, session. So, Dr. Gadret, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so, I will uh, give you the main ideas that um, have been developed um, during this uh, last uh, EHA meeting, uh, which took place in Stockholm a month ago, less than a month ago, actually. Um, as usual, uh, um, we we heard a lot of uh, interesting uh, uh, new developments, and uh, as you probably are well aware of, um, a lot uh, about immunotherapy in the, in the broad in a broad sense. And of course, when we talk about immunotherapy, we talk about uh, antibodies, of course. And, uh, and but uh, not only antibodies, but uh, cellular therapy and, and CAR T cells. As, as you are um, well aware, this is a, a major breakthrough, not only for myeloma, but for um, um, malignant hematology diseases. So um, I will go through these um, slides. Um, this is a summary of uh, the main new uh, uh, drug class that um, have been developed uh, very quickly, actually, within the last uh, uh, 10 years. And um, I mentioned, uh, well, we, 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 we talk of the image, what we talk, what we the first, first, before the image were the potassium, in, well, no, the first one was thalidomide. That this, this was the first immunomodulatory drug, and then we had we have um, um, lenalidomide, revlimid, and, and, and more recently formalinomide, uh, imovid. So this is the first class, major first class. Second, uh, proteasome inhibitors, and uh, we have um, of course fortezomib, velcade, but um, also uh, carfilzomib. Uh, Tiprolis and uh, and Ixazomid uh, Ninlaro. Um, so these are really uh, the two major uh, classes to treat myeloma, along with steroids. It's always more or less um, combined to steroid because it, it does improve their efficacy. And uh, um, we uh, of course also have chemotherapy, and this is. Uh, uh, mostly um, al an alkylating agent called Alkeron, and uh, it's either at low dose for uh, unfit patients or at high dose, uh, myeloablative dose, uh, and that's that's uh, um, uh, that, that's included in what we call autologous stem cell transplantation. So uh, th these are the main, the three main classes that we have, and. and uh, 
and uh, we combine them and uh, we treat uh, myeloma patients. Now we have new uh, 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 drug class, HDAC histone desacetylase as um, inhibitors. Uh, but I must, uh, it's, it's in uh, early development and the, the, the first drugs were not really successful. So, uh, in fact, I will not uh, talk about this um, um, class uh, for the time being. Um, and then we're moving to monoclonal antibody. And um, the first one was uh, Ilotuzumab, the anti uh, SLAM7. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, we now have uh, anti-CD38 antibodies. And the first in class in this class um, is daratumumab. But we also have isatuximab uh, with a big development uh, and, and, and others such as more, uh, it's called more MOR and, uh, and, and um, other uh, antibodies yeah, in development. And we have the adoptive T cell therapy that I mentioned, the CAR T cells and also the chain point inhibitors. Um, um, but this is less developed uh, compared to the solid tumors and to some extent uh, vaccine. So I will uh, discuss briefly uh, about these, um, these drugs um, that we, we or the, the way we are using these drugs um, in the, in the, during this talk. So this is a, a, a brief summary of how uh, these drugs will work. And uh, this is a myeloma cell, and you can see uh, uh, on your left, daratumumab, the anti-CD38 antibody, targeting uh, the, the malignant uh, plasmocytes, and you have the elotuzumab, and then they are also combined to image and steroids. And then um, on the other part to the right, um, upper right, uh, you have the CAR T cells, the checkpoint inhibitors on type PD1, for example, in the myeloma cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And these are um, a kind of uh, uh, cellular therapy and, and a little bit above uh, uh, under this the CAR T cells. And then also you have it's uh, summarized how the imids are working, how the proteasome inhibitors and working and other drugs um, that are in development. Um, before we move on, you remember that we treat myeloma patients at diagnosis differently according to their fitness. Um, and this is also mostly related to their age. Uh, and usually what we call fit patients are patients above, under the age of 65 or now we're moving a little bit um, um, older to 70. And so for these patients, the treatment, the first line, the upfront treatment is an induction regi regimen um, combination. Um, it's um, usually in Europe, Velcade, Thalidomide, Dexamethasone, or Velcade, Revlimid, Dexamethasone, or Velcade, Cyclophosphamide, uh, Cytoxan, Dexamethasone. So we, the patient enter a remission. Then we collect the stem cell, the autologous peripheral blood stem cell, and then they proceed to high-dose melphalon that I mentioned earlier. So this is a myeloablative regimen, and two days later, we infuse the autologous graft in order to decrease the aplasia and the risk uh, of uh, severe infection. Uh, and this is called this procedure autologous stem cell transplantation. And then two or three months later, once the, the hematopoietic system has recovered, uh, we uh, usually give a, a consolidation treatment, which is a, a short treatment, usually similar to the induction regimen, but much, so, uh, much, um, much um, shorter, two times um, VTD, for example. And uh, it is accepted nowadays to follow all this procedure with a maintenance treatment, meaning you, you achieve the best response you, 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 you could and you maintain the good response. And this is currently uh, done and approved uh, with lenalidomide. 
So this is the first line treatment for feed patients. And um, it means that uh, autologous stem cell transplantation remain um, a gold standard for these feed patients. And that should be done upfront. So that's the consensus for the feed patients. For the unfit patients, we uh, are mentioning the, the approved regimen in France. We had, uh, we have, we still have the methylene prednisone plus thalidomide that was um, approved, but um, we now have a, a better regimen called uh, Revlimid plus Dex, and that was uh, following the, that was um, demonstrated by the first trial, the so-called first trial, showing that Revlimid Dex until progression was superior to NPT in terms of PFS and overall survival. So uh, you have Revlimid Dex and you still have the standard first line um, combination uh, called VNP or MPV, Velcade, Melphalan, Prednison. So this is the first line for uh, the unfit, uh, usually patients above the age of 70 years. Um, for the relapse setting, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't think I'm much, well, uh, no, I'm uh, not mentioning it because it's it's much more uh, difficult and uh, um, there, there's no such consensus. Um, this is what was published last year by, by uh, Philippe Moreau as the first author. Um, and that these are the, the, the guidelines, the European guidelines, and it summarizes um, uh, what, I, what I've just said. And that's, that's the, the, the relapse setting. And uh, uh, you, you, uh, as you can see, it's not so uh, clear. And uh, it changes a lot with new approvals. But this is also what was published and, uh, and uh, suggested. So I will uh, split the, uh, the, the, the talk uh, between Transplant eligible, when I mean uh, eligible, I mean uh, transplant eligible to an autologous stem cell transplantation, feed patients, and transplant ineligible. So in the transplant eligible patients, uh, the first question is, what is the best uh, induction regimen? So uh, all kinds of combinations have been uh, tested. Uh, and we had a, um, an oral presentation about the VTD combination compared to TD. And um, it clearly shows that the, the triplet VTD, uh, um, thalidomide DEX, and um, it is more or less accepted nowadays that triplets in general are superior to doublets. And that's that's fair to say, uh, both in the uh, first line treatment, but also in the relapse tra um, uh, treatment. Um, and uh, um, uh, the Italians uh, have developed another. So let me show you. This is the PFS that has been uh, reported with BTD compared to TD. And you can clearly see the superiority of Velcade thalidomide X versus the doublet thalidomide X dimethazone. So, so you should use uh, a triplet uh, for um, uh, induction regimen. So, what is the best triplet? And that um, that that's the the, the question that um, that is uh, that has been raised by the uh, Italian in the so in the so-called Forte trial. And uh, they are using the uh, new um, proteasome inhibitor, carfilzomib, and they are trying to find the best combination, uh, either with lenalidomide or cyclophosphamide, and always with steroids. So this is summarized here. That's the treatment schema. Um, so we're talking about uh, newly diagnosed myeloma patients, transplant eligible and younger than 65 years. And um, we, uh, they reported uh, during this uh, EHA meeting the first part of their study, um, which is uh, the combination, the, 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 the comparison between three induction regimens, 
um, A, KCD, Coffee-Sumaid um, Cyclodex, um, B, KRD, and um, C is uh, actually or oh, still um, KRD. That's it's it's um, for the for the next, for the next um, comparison. So they're combining they're comparing KCD versus KRD, and uh, so this, these are the details of the regimen, and this is the result in terms of response rate, and uh, you can clearly see that uh, in blue you have a KRD, and in uh, a brown um, orange is a KCD. And um, if you look at all the patients on the on your left, and you look at um, um, CR near CR better than near CR, it's dark blue or clean or, or light blue, it's VGPR or better. You can clearly see that KRD is superior to KCD. You see, uh, in terms of VGPR, um, you have 60% with KCD and 75% with KRD. And um, if you look uh, at subgroups, high risk, the so-called high risk patients uh, by FISH or ISS 2 and 3 or revised ISS 2 and 3, it's always superior um, with the combination of KRD uh, versus KCD. And what is also interesting, as you know, we are now targeting not only CR or stringent CR, but what is called MRD, minimal residual disease. And uh, in terms of minimal residual disease, you almost uh, double the MRD rate, moving from 29% with KCD to 56% with KRD. And therefore, um, um, it confirms the superiority of this uh, combination. Um, in terms of toxicity, um, I, I don't have a slide, but uh, it was accepted. Um, and of course, we will come back to that, but carfilzomib has um, some cardiotoxicity, but uh, uh, it is acceptable. So that was the first um, 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 Thema, uh, what is the uh, optimal uh, induction regimen? Now we're moving to the what we call uh, the conditioning regimen. So that means what is the best, which is the best chemotherapy um, when you you want to proceed to to a myeloablative regimen followed by reinfusion of your of the of the um, autologous uh, stem cells. And then, the, which is the altogether what we call the autologous stem cell uh, transplantation. So, uh, for for more than 40 years, high dose melphalan, 200 milligram per meter square, has been the standard of care um, for um, for the conditioning regimen uh, in uh, in the autologous setting. So, uh, investigators investigators have tried to improve uh, this um, uh, conditioning regimen. And they combine it um, with busulfan. And so this is the study done by um, the MD Anderson. And uh, they showed some uh, um, superiority uh, combining the busulfan with melphalan, especially for high risk uh, uh, myeloma. And this is shown here. Uh, however, I should say uh, that uh, phase three uh, randomized trial by the Spanish um, colleagues. Um, um, this is this has not been uh, reported yet, but um, uh, we've heard in in Congress that uh, there was no actually superiority um, to combine busulfan to melphalan. So um, uh, this this study that I'm just showing you um, uh, may be questioned, or but or maybe this is uh, successful only for the high risk myeloma patients. I don't know. Um, the French have, have tried uh, the combination of Velcade plus melphalan, and uh, there was absolutely no difference uh, compared to melphalan alone. Uh, we also have new, um, um, new, new um, kinds of melphalan that are developed and uh, uh, maybe promising for, for the future with the uh, same efficacy and less uh, toxicity, especially uh, mucositis. So, uh, in conclusion, 
um, high dose melphalan remains today the best um, um, conditioning regimen. Then we're moving to consolidation. Do we need to do consolidation? Actually, uh, the, 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 the US uh, colleagues have uh, shown uh, in a very important uh, trial called Stamina that uh, there was uh, no real um, uh, interest in uh, consolidation. But this is not what we've um, seen in uh, many trials in Europe. And this, is, uh, this has been reported uh, um, uh, two weeks ago by the EM EMN, the European Myeloma Network. And that, that's a randomized um, um, phase three trial. That's the summary of the trial. So you can see they have an induction regime with BCD, three to four cycles. They collect the stem cells and then they move either to high dose melphalan or no um, autologous stem cell transplantation up front. And it's one high dose, one, one transplant or even two transplants. And the second randomization is no consolidation or two cycles of BRD. So we're, that's what we are looking at now. And um, as you can see here, in terms of response, adding two cycles of VRD does improve uh, the response. You see, uh, if we look at um, uh, response after consolidation and we look at stringent CR or CR, no consolidation, 20% and 38% if you add these two cycles of VRD. So uh, it does improve the response rate adding um, a short uh, consolidation. So consolidation, um, even though it's not uh, strictly speaking written in the in the European guidelines, is is quite common practice uh, uh, in Europe. Another interesting topic, and I mentioned that um, earlier when we talk about feed patients. Um, there was this uh, idea that autologous uh, stem cell transplantation could not be performed above the age of 65. Uh, however, lately, um, many studies have shown that for fit patients, even if they are above 65, um, having in mind that transplantation remains the gold standard, um, if the patient is fit, whatever its age actually, uh, he should um, try to get uh, an autologous stem cell transplantation. And that's, that's what has been uh, um, shown uh, uh, in many um, uh, retrospective studies. And um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you some uh, abstracts. And um, uh, the Myeloma 11 trial, which is a big, big, big trial with almost 2,000 uh, people, uh, patients have uh, looked at um, uh, it was more focused on the, on the role of uh, lenalidomide maintenance, but they, retrospectively they looked at patients um, um, uh, who uh, got a transplant and patients who did not uh, get a transplant. Here you can see uh, transplant eligible are uh, the blue um, uh, diagram and in red uh, transplant non transplant eligible, and the, the idea of being transplanted or, or, or not was according to the physician. Um, and in between, you see, you can see people who are both in the blue um, histogram and in the pink histogram. And um, so therefore, they look at this patient population and they compared retrospectively those who had a transplant uh, with those who did not get the transplant within the same age uh, um, uh, period. And uh, um, they, they, they actually uh, they showed that um, uh, the benefit of autologous cell cell transplantation upfront was confirmed for patients above the age of 65. And here you have another study um, looking at um, um, patients above 65 or less than 65, and, uh, and, and all these patients got a transplant. And uh, you can see on this uh, slide that um, whatever the age, I mean, there, there was no difference in terms of PFS and overall survival, uh, meaning that even for fit patients above the age of 65, the toxicity is acceptable and, 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 and as long as they are fit enough to proceed to this um, high-dose uh, melphalon uh, treatment. 
So in conclusion, for the transplant eligible patients, um, um, a lot of development in terms of drug combination to find the best induction regimen, the best consolidation, and also the best maintenance. And, um, and um, in terms of conditioning regimen, high-dose melphalan remains the standard, and all the patients who are fit enough should get an autologous stem cell transplantation up front. For the non-transplant eligible patient, uh, again, we are trying to uh, find the best uh, treatment. I mentioned that MPV was uh, an excellent combination. MPV or VNP or Revlimidex was the other the, uh, alternative. And uh, <clears throat> We heard again about this um, um, three, uh, quadruplet combination, which is VMP plus the monoclonal antibody on anti CD38, daratumumab. And that was actually presented at ASH 2017 uh, and published sim simultaneously uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. That it is the Alcyon, uh, this Alcyon trial. And uh, they, they presented again uh, the same trial, but focusing on, a, on the subgroup of patients uh, above the age of uh, 65. So that's the schema of the Alcyon study, VNT versus VNT plus daratumumab. These are the results that have been uh, presented and published showing the superiority of VNP dara versus VNP. And the toxicity uh, is uh, <clears throat> acceptable. Um, and uh, you can see that um, uh, patients uh, above the age of uh, 65 have a little, little bit more uh, hematotoxicity, uh, but, um, uh, and especially uh, thrombocytopenia. Um, but uh, all in all, uh, the, the, the infection rate is similar, um, I mean, relatively similar. Uh, so the, the, the conclusion is that uh, DARA VNP is superior to VNP and uh, whatever the age of the, of, uh, of, of the patient. Uh, so it's probably, probably in the near future, it will become a new uh, standard of first line treatment for the non-transplant eligible patients. Now we're moving to the relapse setting, and uh, we had some uh, interesting development. Um, so um, this is elotuzumab and uh, how it works, and this is daratumumab, and daratumumab works the same way as elotuzumab, but uh, it also has some immune modulation, and that's why uh, it is um, um, highly uh, efficacious. So we had all kinds of uh, drug combinations, especially with pomalidomide dex as the backbone. So pomalidomide dex plus ELO, pomalidomide uh, uh, dex plus uh, more, that I, more 202 that I mentioned, another uh, anti-CD38. Um, uh, we also had uh, pomalidomide dex plus isatuximab, the new uh, anti-CD38. And um, there was a focus actually uh, on the optimism uh, uh, study um, with pomalidomide velcate dex versus velcate dex, showing the superiority uh, of the triplet above the doublet. And especially, and this this study was especially designed for patients who had already been exposed and who were refractory in more than 70% to lenalidomide. And if you remember, um, if we consider that lenalidomide maintenance is, is until progression is, uh, is more and more uh, common practice, um, that, that's an important information for these patients who will progress um, and while um, um, in, in, um, while having a treatment with lenalidomide, then they can um, successfully be, be, be rescued with uh, pomalidomide-based uh, regimen and especially uh, pomalidomide velcade uh, dex. So uh, that's, that's the first study uh, that was for a late breaking abstract. 
um, combining POMDEX with POMDEX plus elotuzumab, showing the superiority of the triplet. Uh, and then uh, we're moving to the optimism uh, regimen, as, as you can see, PVD, uh, median PFS is 11 months, and VD is 7 months. And uh, if you focus on patients who got only one prior line of treatment, uh, you almost double the PFS from uh, 11 months to 20 months. So uh, uh, for the relapsed uh, setting, uh, pomalidomide-based uh, regimen uh, is probably one of the best uh, uh, drug combinations. Now uh, we can um, have a, a focus on carfilzomib. Carfilzomib is highly efficacious. You should remember that uh, the, the, the trial uh, comparing head-to-head -head, uh, KD, carfilzomib dex versus velcade dex, and carfilzomib was twice superior to velcade dex. Um, so now the question is how to improve um, is, uh, the, its management. And um, the first thing is um, uh, to switch from twice weekly to once weekly. This is the so-called ARROW study, and um, that, uh, that has shown that once weekly with the higher dose of uh, carfilzomib, um, you, you get uh, uh, the same, same efficacy with less toxicity, and, and it's more convenient. Uh, you, the patient only has to come once a week. And um, um, many investigators are trying also to decrease the so-called uh, cardiotoxicity uh, of uh, carfilzomib. I will mention two new drugs, uh, venetoclax, uh, which, is, uh, which is an anti-apoptotic uh, protein uh, uh, drug targeting. Um, this is especially uh, efficacious for patients who have a translocation 1114, and uh, we have already uh, combined venetoclax with uh, ceres, with velcade, and even with carfilzomib with very encouraging uh, results. This is a schema of um, how it works, uh, and the combination on your right you see of venetoclax, the anti BCL2, uh, plus uh, bortezomib, and you increase the apoptosis. Um, this is an in vitro uh, study uh, showing uh, the synergic, uh, synergistic activity uh, uh, of, the, of the drug. That's venetoclax plus dexamethasone. So that's in vitro and that's uh, uh, in patients. And you can see that when you add dexamethasone to venetoclax, you uh, increase the um, efficacy uh, of the, this new drug with an overall response for, from 40 to 65%. And finally, Selinexor. Selinexor is, is also uh, very attractive and uh, has been uh, tested uh, for uh, very advanced um, uh, patients. And um, the, the, the preliminary results in this very uh, advanced, uh, very uh, heavily uh, pre-treated uh, patients um, uh, give um, uh, interesting um, uh, results. I will uh, finish with some words on biology. And um, um, I will mention again the monoclonal antibody, and especially what we call the, the bite. And this is uh, very promising. It's um, the, what we call bite, means it's uh, antibody linking making a bridge between the effector cells, the anti-myeloma cells, namely the, the, the T lymphocytes, and the, the a, a target, um, a specific target on the, on the malignant plasmocyte. So, um, so you, 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 this is very promising. Um, and uh, this, is, this is shown here. It's called, so you have it's you, you, this, this antibody uh, link CD3. CD3 is the T lymphocytes with BCMA, which is the, the plasma sites um, target. And you can see that it's, uh, it's uh, highly efficacious. So you see the, the in vitro lysis, lysis of the, of the tumor cells, 
in newly diagnosed myeloma patients in lenalidomide refractory in both lenalidomide and daratumumab refractory patients. You see the dark line much above um, uh, the other lines, uh, showing that the lysis, the percentage of uh, lysis is very high. Uh, and even if patients uh, uh, have received daratumumab, uh, the, the, the treatment, uh, um, it's, it's, it's even, actually, it's even better if patients have been dara exposed um, uh, before using this uh, bite, this, this, this uh, bite specific antibodies. Um, this is, uh, I will not cover this, this topic, uh, but um, I think it's interesting to see um, that that was uh, done by uh, our um, uh, uh, colleagues from Holland, showing that. Um, uh, for patients who have received daratumumab, uh, you should, you still should, um, I mean, you should, they still have a very uh, efficacious uh, uh, immune system, um, which is able to um, um, induce um, uh, the production of uh, antibodies uh, to be protected against um, um, the infections, the most common infections. Um, against um, Streptococcus pneumoniae and um, uh, influenzae, uh, Haemophilus influenzae um, uh, infection. So this is important. It, it means that even when you uh, receive daratumumab, your immune system is is strong enough to uh, to 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 respond to the vaccination, and therefore uh, patients should be uh, vaccinated, even even though. Uh, they have, uh, they are, they have been treated with daratumumab. So I think this is important in the daily practice. Uh, biomarkers is just to show you that we are trying uh, to, um, uh, in the near future, to uh, give some kind of uh, uh, tailored medicine. Um, Currently, uh, we, we, we go from one drug to another one and we hope it works with not too much toxicity and what, once, it, it, once it does not work, we move to another drug. But of course, uh, it would be much better um, first if we had some personalized medicine. As you know, myeloma is extremely heter heterogeneous and, and therefore some patients do respond and don't, or others do not and the toxicity is also different. So we have to uh, characterize better the subgroups of myeloma and in the near future we will probably know better uh, who should benefit from this drug uh, compared to, 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 to that one. And this is, this is, these are, for example, um, um, proteins that are important for some drug efficacy uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, you can see the PFS and OS is different if, if you have a, um, uh, according to uh, some specific proteins that are the targets of specific drugs. Uh, I'm finishing with AL amyloidosis. Actually, there was no, no, not too much um, um, talk about about this, um, and the, not not because there are no new developments, but a lot of had been said uh, uh, at ASH, I guess. Uh, I will just mention that uh, uh, daratumumab and the French, the French um, uh, have pioneered um, a phase two study showing that daratumumab can induce um, um, a high rate of uh, hematological response and, and very fast and, and, and with a, and a very, a very um, um, good uh, tolerability. Um, and, and as you know, also daratumumab will very soon be um, given subcute, subcutaneously, which is much more convenient. And this is uh, you, you have you have the PAGO study, and, um, and there is another study, ongoing study called the Andromeda study, combining daratumumab with CyborG, which is cyber, the, one of the best drug combination that we have in uh, in uh, AL amyloidosis. And therefore, we can expect that um, uh, combining cyborg with daratumumab, we will definitely 
uh, improve probably dramatically um, the the response uh, um, to 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 um, to treat AL uh, amyloidosis. I just mentioned the different uh, um, topics that um, uh, we uh, could um, hear during this uh, EHA meeting, and it was more or less um, all around the immune therapy, around the monoclonal antibodies, around, along the cellular therapy that I mentioned at the very beginning of, of, of the talk, and um, for sure it will uh, it will also very much improve. Uh, the management of of, um, of myeloma, but uh, it's too early uh, to say um, uh, how we can use it and when shall we use it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gadaret. I think you, you did an outstanding review of all the updates, most of the most important updates uh, presented at EHA. Um, so right now I think we have 10 minutes left for, for, for the questions time. Some of you have already uh, sent me some questions. I just reminded that you have two ways of making your questions. For those of you who want to make your questions live by voice, just yes, please press the raise hand uh, icon and I will open the mic for you. Or just type your question in the chat window and I will pass it over to, to Dr. Catherine. So uh, the first question says, um, the results found about the addition of daratumumab to Belkate, Melphalan and Prednisone seems very impressive at, as first line treatment. From your opinion, do you think it will become the standard of treatment in clinical practice in the coming years? So uh, daratumumab is, um, is, is a very good drug, very good monoclonal antibody. Uh, it is um, it is currently developed in development in all uh, phases of myeloma treatment, uh, upfront, uh, at relapse, of course, uh, but also upfront um, for standard myeloma, but also for smoldering uh, multiple myeloma. Um, it, it will definitely pro i mean i'm quite sure that it will be used the same way as we are using uh, rituximab to treat uh, lymphoma uh, as you even though even though you're not you may not be familiar with this this disease but uh, we have many um, regimen to treat myeloma or all kinds of different myeloma every for all, all the all the regimen they are combined with this anti-CD20 called um, uh, rituximab. So it's always rituximab plus X. Well, I, I believe now in myeloma, it will be the same. It will be daratumumab plus X. So now we have, um, the, the Spanish have shown that uh, VMP plus dara was superior to VMP. And uh, I'm quite sure it will be a new uh, first line uh, uh, standard treatment uh, for uh, non-transplant eligible patients, but uh, the French uh, have uh, st uh, studied VTD plus or minus DARA, uh, the so-called Cassiopeia study, the IFM study uh, for the transplant eligible, and it's it's I don't see why uh, VTD plus DARA uh, will not be superior to VTD alone. So it's a general. Um, it, it will apply. Um, you know, uh, not only in the in the first line setting, but in the relapse setting. In the relapse setting, and this is already approved. Um, Velke Pollux study, RD plus Dara is superior to RD. Uh, Velke Dex plus Dara, um, Castor study is superior to Velke Dex. So uh, uh, we we will see study by study, but. Uh, uh, um, I will be very surprised if uh, the, the quadruplet, even though I, I don't, I'm not sure it's, if it's, we can call it a quadruplet, I would call it, call it a, a triplet plus a monoclonal antibody. Um, yes, I think it's, it, it will become a, a standard of care. Okay, thank you for your response. Uh, the next question is related with the uh, curfilsomy that it says, uh, should a patient with previous cardiac issues and heart surgery dismiss the option or going through a curfilsomy based regime due to the cardiotoxicity? 
should um, should can you rephrase yeah. it? Yeah, so, it? so see, he asked whether a patient with a preview cardiac issues and also with heart surgery uh, dismiss the option of going through a carfilzomib based regime, uh, basically due to the cardiotoxicity, to see whether having previous cardiac issues is related. It's it's not recommended for using carfilzomib. So carfilzomib toxicity, car cardiac toxicity is um, um, is an issue. Um, um, however, um, um, so the French have, have reported then uh, that um, the, the, there was some cardiac um, dysfunction, some hypertension uh, in about um, seven percent of the patients. Um, some investigators, uh, especially in the U.S., uh, Jakuboviak in, in, and, and also Ole Langren in, uh, at the NIH, uh, have a, um, an extensive experience uh, using carfilzomib and, and also in combination, uh, KRD, K, KTD, and, and, um, um, and other investigators have shown that actually um, it, it, it may not be uh, as serious as we first um, uh, thought. Um, I, 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 I'm not saying that it's not an, it's 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 not a problem. What I'm saying is is that um, uh, if we are careful, careful means uh, if you um, have a strict control of of the blood um, pressure uh, and you should be absolutely within the normal range. Um, if you do not give too much fluid um, um, uh, while you're uh, giving uh, um, a carfilzomib, uh, if you monitor strictly uh, the patient um, during the treatment, uh, and uh, as you mentioned for this specific case, is if the patient already had, uh, had some cardiac issues, uh, you should of course uh, um, 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 do a complete checkup uh, of, of, the, of, of the cardiac, um, of, of its, its cardiac condition. Uh, um, you, you, uh, the patient should be able to, to, um, uh, to, to get it to, without uh, the, too much trouble. So to answer your question, even though uh, a patient may have had some past Cardiac history, even maybe even cardiac surgery, uh, per se, I do not think this is a contra contraindication. Um, meaning, of course, we will be very careful. Uh, we will do again a complete um, um, uh, checkup, uh, cardiac checkup. We will monitor strictly. We will be very careful uh, uh, to to have a strict control of the of the of of, of, his, of his tension and. Again, uh, very few fluids, and um, and so so we are learning actually how to use this very efficacious uh, drug, uh, and therefore um, we, we we will probably uh, improve uh, its uh, tolerability. So to summarize. Um, and I have never heard uh, so far that having a past history of some kind of cardiac illness uh, does not preclude uh, the patient to uh, receive carfilzomib. Okay, thanks. It seems that we have time for the for the last few questions. So the first one says, uh, um, if I am correct, right now patients are being divided basically by the risk. Um, by their eligibility to have transplant or not. Is there any current study aiming to stratify patients based in other issues such as certain biomarker or prognosis factors? Um, sorry, can you repeat? I, I didn't yeah. hear very well. So this patient says that right now uh, he knows that patients are being divided uh, or, or the treatment is decided uh, basically by uh, stratifying them by the risk, whether they have a standard risk or high risk, or their eligibility to have transplant or not. So he asked whether there is any current study trying to stratify patients based on other issues such as biomarkers or prognosis factors. 
uh, no, what what the the, the new the new uh, uh, I mean, this is an important question. Um, it's it's again to um, to give a more personalized uh, treatment. And uh, for example, the high risk patient uh, should they get high risk? Let's talk about the patients with a deletion 17P and or to some extent some of translocation uh, 414. Um, um, it, uh, the, 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 we know that these patients have a less favorable uh, prognosis and therefore there is a, a, a train to not only um, uh, give uh, one uh, autologous stem cell transplantation but two in, in tandem within three months and uh, even though this is not um, uh, completely a consensus um, patients who have a 17p deletion uh, may probably uh, benefit from uh, uh, a tandem autologous stem cell uh, transplantation um, what we are within the IFM and, uh, and of course, uh, all over uh, with all, all the other colleagues, um, all, all the other investigators, is, is trying to uh, adapt the treatment to the MRD, minimal residual disease. And, uh, and uh, uh, probably uh, uh, this will be very important in the future. Uh, so that's why we are measuring the MRD uh, at the end of induction, after the transplant, before the consolidation, after, before the maintenance, and uh, uh, it will very, uh, it will be probably a very um, the new endpoint, and uh, and uh, we will adjust uh, the treatment according to MRD positivity or negativity. Uh, coming back to biomarkers. Uh, I mentioned the translocation 1114. Uh, translocation 1114 uh, do benefit from uh, venetoclax, and especially also in combination. So uh, uh, yes, uh, you see, we, we we are starting to to, uh, but but this is slow. Uh, it's a slow process, but to to uh, give some more personalized medicine. Uh, for some, uh, for, I mentioned uh, patients with deletion 17P, uh, translocation 414, translocation 1114, uh, and then the response to the treatment, and I mentioned the MRD. So um, it's fair to say that today, more or less, all the patients uh, get the same treatment, uh, except uh, as, as, as this, um, 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 as you just mentioned, uh, except if they are fit or, un, un, or not fit for the, for the transplant, uh, but but we will we will uh, um, for sure we will treat more uh, specifically to the disease that the patient um, has in the near future. Uh, thanks for that for that question, and I think we have uh, we have a one last question. Uh, who says, how long do you think it will take to have venetoclax, ixatuzumab, and Selnexor available to patients outside trials? Uh, will this drug soon become a standard of care? Which which one? The, the uh, ven standard? Uh, venetoclax, ixatuzumab, and Selnexor. Uh, well, uh, in France, we do have access uh, to... Um, well, no, that's it's, it's within a trial. Uh, it, 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 it takes time, you know. It's, it's, it is first, of course, uh, tested in a, within trials, and uh, um, uh, I, I know for patients it, it, it's, it's important. But it's important to uh, understand also that uh, uh, before we, we we know for for sure that a drug is not only efficacious but not toxic. Uh, we we need trials. When will this happen, and uh, when will we get free access to? You mentioned venetoclax, seninexor, isatuximab. Maybe uh, within the next uh, couple of years. Okay. And of course, it depends from country to country.
Yeah, always access access is always an, an issue in this particular case. Yeah. Exactly. So so I think we have run out uh, of of time, and uh, before closing up this webinar, I would like to, uh, on behalf of MPE, to thank you again, Dr. Gatheret, for for your time today. I think I think your your talk was splendid. That it was really useful to really know about all these exciting updates coming coming for, out from from EHA 2018. Uh, for for all of you attending this webinar today, uh, just remind you that this record the, the full recording of this webinar will be uploaded shortly uh, to our website and also to our YouTube channel and share across our social media. Um, also, for, for those of you attending for the first time to one of our webinars, I would like to encourage you to visit our website and go to our member section so you can contact your local myeloma group in case you haven't done it yet. Uh, being said that, uh, I, I would really thank you all for, for your attending and I hope uh, that we see each other soon in another MPS webinar. I wish you all a very a very good evening and, and thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Gadaret, for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.